Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Entrepreneur Motivation Podcast. I am your host, Chris Bello, and today I've got Rob Eigner on the show. Rob, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, Chris. I really appreciate it. Great to have you. And there's quite a bit behind you here. I was reading through some of the bullet points that you sent over. I mean, no big deal. Parents are Holocaust survivors. They own businesses, but we're blue collar, hardworking people. I'd love to dive into all of this because I know that shaped you as who you are today. Former athlete, you've worked in advertising, publishing, technology, and most recently real estate. And you currently own several real estate brokerages as well as related businesses. You're an investor in real estate as well as a business coach. And you've been married for 20 years and you have two boys, 17 and 13. So like I was joking before we hit record, like, oh, you're a regular person just like us, but you've got a different story, different upbringing and background. And so all of those things shaped who you are today. And I can't wait to dive into your story a little bit today. So welcome once again. Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, it's, there's uh, there. When I hear all that, I'm like, wow, I've I've done quite a bit. I, you know, you get fo- <laughs> you get focused on what you're doing in the moment, and then you hear something like that, and you're like, I've done, I've covered some pavement, you know. Yeah, you've covered some ground there for sure. So, Rob, I mean, feel free. We could take this any any way. I know you talk about a lot of these different topics. I've I've glanced through your site as well. Your parents have spoken about their story. How did that shape you growing up? I mean, just their background and their upbringing, what they had to go through. Did that have a big impact, would you say, on who you became as a person? Uh, no, no question about it. You know, not to, to do too deep of a dive on the Holocaust, but, you know, most people who've gone through the Holocaust, survived the Holocaust or any other major trauma. I mean, they could be a, a war, a war veteran or a prisoner of war or just something else significant like that. You know, they they usually walk away with some emotional scar tissue. And uh, and certainly, you know, my parents have some of that and and therefore some of that's been passed on to me and my sister but i think the way it really shaped me is that um i chose to kind of look at the the positives of that experience and i know that might sound contradictory to people listening but but you know what you get from surviving something like that is resiliency for example you become resourceful you know you can choose and my parents chose you know you can choose glass half empty or glass half full. And my parents just happen to be glass half full kind of people. So as I got older and started to learn about their history, which wasn't until in my late teens, I started to kind of slowly understand how that negative or seemingly negative and traumatic experience really had some positive character building characteristics for me. Absolutely. I mean, do they just kind of sit you down at dinner one day and be like, "Hey, surprise! This is what happened." And how did no, you it, yeah, it's a good question. Um, uh, I talk about this a lot when I when I speak about their history, and that is that um, I was in a history class in high school, and my parents hadn't spoken about it at all. Like all I knew was my parents were from Hungary, and uh, I'm in a history class, and they're talking about World War II and the Jews and what countries were impacted when by the Nazis. And I was like, wait a, wait a second here, you know, in my head, my parents are Hungarian. My parents are Jewish. They were there during those years. Like what the heck happened to my parents? Right. So I just literally came home and I was like, Hey, I was in history class today. And blah, what was going on for you guys? And they were, they were a little bit like, I don't want to say defensive. They, they were reluctant to discuss it under, you know, a, they didn't want to open up their history, historical wounds and b. I don't think they wanted to contaminate me and my sister with, you know, that baggage, if you will. But I was curious and interested and shocked, you know, to some level. And so I pushed and asked them questions and just slowly, slowly, it took years. I mean, many years and well into my twenties before they were like really openly talking about it. Um, So so that's kind of how it came to be. Well, thank you for sharing that. I mean, there's, it's very crazy whenever you meet people who have gone through those things, it's hard to relate, right? I mean, did you have a pretty good upbringing, would you say? I mean, you were pretty distanced from anything super traumatic, I would hope. Um, yeah, no, I, I would say, you know, I, uh, one of the things I do in my my talks when I when I speak about my parents is there's this, this three or four page introduction I wrote many years ago when my parents were being honored in Portland, Oregon, my hometown, for being on the board of building this Holocaust Memorial in in Portland, Oregon. And so I got to do this introductory speech uh, for them. And I called the speech normal. And the reason I called it normal was because, you know, my parents sort of 
became my heroes, if you will. I mean, for many reasons, but one of the reasons was despite everything they went through, we were still really normal. Like it, if it weren't for that history class and, you know, maybe if I were a little smarter, I would have figured it out earlier, but I figured it out when I figured it out. And, uh, but, you know, like you wouldn't have known I was the child of Holocaust survivors because they, we were normal. You know, we went on vacations and yeah. we had great meals and we, I played sports and, you know, they cared about us doing well in school and there was stuff, you know, but there, I think there's stuff everywhere. I'm sure you got stuff from your parents and my wife got stuff from her parents and I got stuff from my parents and some of it was good. And some of it was things I needed to overcome. Absolutely. I think that's the craziest thing about just growing up. I remember hearing the statistic. I can't remember the exact age, but a lot of who you are as a person happens before you're six years old or something like that. And I can't even remember anything before third grade, I think is my earliest memory of playing on the playground or Pokemon cards or something like that. And so it's crazy that so much can shape you and you have no idea or memory in most cases of what those things were, what were those conversations, any trauma that may be there that could be affecting how you bring you show up today and you have no real clue about what it was. Well, and interesting that you say that, you know, I was, I went to graduate school for psychology and uh, one of the documentaries that one of my professors shared was one, uh, one called, and this would be interesting for your listeners to look up. Yeah. It's called seven up 28 up. And uh, what it was, it's a black and white documentary that some British psychologists did. And they interviewed, I don't know, 20 or 30 kids at the age of seven from all kinds of socioeconomic and, and ethnic backgrounds in England. And they interviewed them at seven, asked them a series of questions and, you know, what they thought of girls or what they thought of boys and what they thought of money and just black and white and just everything you can imagine. And then they came back to those same kids at the age of 28. And it was amazing, almost to a T, most of the kids, you could kind of pick, oh, yeah, that's that's Joey. I can tell that's Joey, not just because of how they look, but how they thought and you know their personalities were formed. I mean, there was a couple that were you were surprised how radically changed they were, but most of the personalities were fairly well formed at seven. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, it, it's crazy to see. I, I had a roommate, for example, and she had a two-year-old living with us for a while and now that I knew about this, I had never really been around. Like I don't have any children of my own, for example. I just turned 30 last year. I, I'm a fur baby parent. Like I have a dog and two cats, but I know that's not the same as human children. But I got to kind of experience that a little bit of the little girl running around and you know running into the wall and falling and watching Magic School Bus or whatever. I was like, oh, I remember this show. And I was almost wanting to be very careful about what I said and just say empowering things because I mean, she's a two-year-old, but she's seeing things and observing things and subconsciously being programmed. And so I knew that if I were to drop any, you know, explicatives or have a conversation that would be angry about something, I don't want to have a negative effect on her life down the road because of something that I said. And so that was on my mind in a way that hadn't been previously once I learned about that. Well, yeah, there's no question that having children, I have two teenage boys and, uh, uh, there's a, I'm, I'm assuming I'll probably have it the rest of my life, this awareness of, Hey, I'm, I'm being watched and observed. I'm a, I'm a role model of, of some kind. And, Definitely. you know, I think I do pretty well at it most of the time, but you know, I'm human. I have my moments where I'm like, Ooh, I, I'm embarrassed that I just acted that way. But, you know, we all have our breaking point sometimes. Yeah. And I think what you mentioned there, it's just really powerful to be self-conscious and try to analyze what you're doing and how would I have done that differently? And maybe that wasn't the best way that I just express my emotions. The fact that you're cognizant and aware of that, I think is a big deal. Cause a lot of people just, they're in their mode. They say their things, they scream, they yell. You see the parents at Walmart yelling at their kids in front of everyone. And you're just like, well, like that's not right. You know, I, you can't tell other people how to do whatever they do. Um, but at the same time, the fact that you're aware of yourself and how you feel, and maybe I should have done that differently. I think that's a very important step. A lot of people need to take to really just be reflective constantly. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. So that helps to share kind of where you are now in terms of your, your role model, you know, that what you do impacts your children and obviously they're going to model you to some extent and see you as the example. Like we talked about when I was interviewed on your show, 
I grew up with parents that maybe had ideas of money, like scarcity or doing everything yourself instead of outsourcing. Why would you pay someone to cook and clean and do all those things if you can just do it yourself? Did you have any of that programming that you had to rewire your brain, you know, when you grew up or? Yeah, I would say, you know, it's a, it's a never ending process. Like it's still, it's still happening, but for sure, you know, one of the common threads that Holocaust survivors have is scarcity. So it's funny that you brought up that word. I mean, scarcity around food, scarcity around money, you know, just kind of a, an overall feeling of, um, you know, a need, a need for safety, you know, and, and, and lack. And so, yeah, that absolutely was, um, was something I had to get around. So, you know, whether it's, whether it's hiring a personal assistant in my business or whether it's hiring someone to leverage me on a podcast or whatever. um, Those are things that I do because I'm educated enough to know that they're going to make me better and freer and all that, but it's not easy. It's still not easy. You know Um, I'll tell you something interesting. Uh, You know, we we've had a maid, you know, coming to our house for, I can't remember not having a maid, Uh, but when COVID hit, you know, we were like, oh, wow, you know, we maybe we shouldn't have the maid for a while. And the kids are home going to school and my wife's working in the back house and I'm working in the front house and, you know, we're all home. So we just started cleaning the house as a family ritual, you know, once a week. OK, you vacuum, you do this, you do the bathroom, you know, whatever. And we did it for quite a while. And I wouldn't say it was a scarcity thing. It was really, truly a reaction to the COVID situation, but it did make me think as I was doing it, like, oh, you know, this isn't that bad. It's like, you know, costing me an hour and a half a week. It's not that bad to keep the house clean, but I didn't enjoy it, certainly. And I'm happier now that we have the maid coming back, (laughs) but, but it did kind of bring up these topics, these issues that you're bringing up. Definitely. It's very interesting to see. I mean, I know you said you're involved in real estate and investing in coaching and it's interesting to see how people can have different backgrounds and upbringing and you, what you know as your reality is your reality. You grew up how you grew up. Oftentimes you think that's how everyone grew up, but it's very crazy whenever you see people have totally different realities. I, I've done some vision casting and jogging through River Oaks is an area here in Houston where I live where multi-million dollar mansions, beautiful cars in the driveway. And this was before COVID, but I remember seeing all the little kids walking home from the private school that kind of was close to that neighborhood and they have no idea, you know, parents picking them up in amazing supercars or Bentleys or Rolls Royces. That's their normal. Whereas someone who had a normal of, Oh, I got to take a Brown bag lunch to school and it's a sandwich every day. Those are totally different realities. And I feel like it does take a little bit of time to reprogram your mind, to see the abundance that maybe some other kid just grew up with because of the the family that they had or, you know, the wealth that they grew up with. Um, so did you have any of that? I mean, did you ever see the wealth versus the poverty in your life or were your friends all kind of in the same circle? I would say that we were, uh, the circle that I grew up in was sort of comfortably middle class, um, not wealthy, but certainly not um, wanting in any, you know, right. m- major way. Uh, and I think, I think, you know, what I try to give my kids uh, as a different experience or an additional experience, because my parents taught a lot of like, you know, hard work and, you know, uh, you know, grit, and determination and resiliency kind of um, right. models, which I resonate with. Um, but I think there was sort of a, 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 a play it safe kind of mentality, too. And so I'm, I try with my own kids uh, through example, you know, I've taken risks and started multiple businesses and whatnot, and most of them have worked out and very few haven't, but you know, it's painful when they don't. Um, But I've tried to demonstrate to my kids that, you know, to, to kind of go to that next level of, of comfort and wealth and uh, whatnot, you know, you you, you usually have to take some chances. If you, if you research where the bulk of, the top one percenters have made their wealth. You know, it's either in owning a business or owning real estate. Definitely. You no, know, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure people inherit it, but I'm not counting that because that's not a that's not a career path inheriting. Uh, right. You can't bank on that. <laughs> yeah, you can't bank on that. That, that. That's not how I'm gonna get wealthier. Um, but I think you know, yeah. So I'm trying to show my kids, like, all right, well, if you really want to be wealthy. Because, you know, how I mean, you maybe you don't know because you don't have kids, but, you know, they're like, oh, I want to be rich. It's like, OK, well, I remember you know, wanting that when I was a kid, too. 
<laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's like, all right, well, you know, you probably have to start at a job to get enough experience so you can figure out what pathway you're going to take, what business you might consider starting or how you're going to earn enough money so you can invest in real estate or other things that will build that kind of wealth. So I'm trying to show them that pathway. And I think that pathway requires some risk. And um, not that my parents haven't taken risk. They have. They own apartment buildings and whatnot. But they're definitely um, they've definitely historically been safer than me. So that's something I guess I had to overcome as it relates to your original question. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like you did a great job of that. I mean, just the fact that you have been taking the risks and calculated risks, of course, it's good to hear that more have been successful than have not been. But the fact that you're willing to try and stretch your comfort zone, that sends a great message to your kids as well. I'm I'm sure they're seeing all the things that you're doing, the sacrifices that you've made to get to where you are. If you just play it safe all the time, I mean, like you said, None of the 1% were people who played it, say, unless maybe they inherited something, but we're not counting those, of course. Yeah, and then there's plenty of top one percenters who uh, have been bankrupt. Yeah. You know, they they crash and burn. You know, they were worth 10 million or 20 million or 50 million, and they their business, you know, met its demise, and they restarted themselves and built themselves back up. So that's, you know, I don't want to have that happen to me, but it's motivational nonetheless. Absolutely. I mean, I I just saw someone share that uh, CC's Pizza is filing for bankruptcy or something. And I remember growing up as a kid and seeing the one of the owners of the franchises or something out here. I remember the guy had a mustache. I think his name was Ray. We would go to CC's and then go to Laser Zone and play laser tag. And I just thought of him when I saw that article, because I remember seeing him running the rest, running the restaurant and helping people set everything up. And I mean, that's with COVID and everything having such an impact on so many businesses, it was kind of tough to see that and just think about, man, that kid, that guy has kids, he's got a family, what's he going to do? And so learning to pivot and like you said, bounce back, a lot of people up there have had failures, have fallen on their face, have filed for bankruptcy. But the thing is, you can't quit, of course. So consistency, grit, determination, those are huge habits that you need to develop how have you developed that in your life? Have you, I know you were a former athlete. Was it skiing? I think I was looking at my notes. Did you do skiing? Yeah. Ski racing was my, my primary sport. I mean, I played a lot. I wrestled, um, okay. in high school. I, um, I played soccer in high school. I ran track, I played tennis, uh, but skiing was sort of where I reached the highest, uh, pinnacle, if you will. Awesome. But all, but all of it, um, I think, you know, there's just something about sports uh, uh, that to me is just a metaphor for generating success. So, um, you know, just the, the the teamwork that's involved in a team sport, you know, all the hours that you have to put behind the scenes, you know, like people who watch sports on television, they just go, oh, wow, those guys are so lucky they get to do that. Well, they don't see all the hours in the gym and the knee surgeries and the injuries and the, the pulled hamstrings and all the times you didn't get to start or play and you're battling for your position. All that stuff, you know, adds up to an amazing metaphor for how to be successful. No matter what level, like it doesn't matter if you're just a high school athlete or you're a college athlete or whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, even just a recreational level, it's that competition and focus it, that it takes to win at anything. It's uh, it's useful in everything. I absolutely agree. I mean, I did some of those sports as well. Wrestling, it's a team sport, even though it feels very solo when you're there wrestling somebody who's maybe shorter than you, but more muscular. I, I set, had some of that where I'm like, oh gosh, I got pinned so fast. I didn't even know what happened. What, uh, what weight class were you? I think I wrestled 145 initially and I ended up getting up to 165 by the end of high school. So how about you? How about you? I was one, I was small at the time. I was 123. I wish I uh, well I don't want to weigh 123, but I don't want to weigh what I weigh right now either. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we're not at our quote unquote fighting weight or wrestling weight, but um it like you said it's just such a great experience in terms of learning the team dynamics like, you know, morning workouts, evening workouts, weekend workouts, driving to competitions in other places and being in a van with sweaty people. Just all that sacrifice, right? All the sacrifice. It's so, it's such a great metaphor for what you have to do with business. People just see the quote unquote overnight success. Maybe they see the businesses that you own and the properties and the real estate investments, but they don't see the, the offers you made that fell through, the t- tenants you inherited that didn't pay, that you had to evict, things like that. I mean, 
every day presents a series of challenges and you have to just be determined to show up and handle them as best you can, which I'm sure you have been doing in your businesses as well. Absolutely. No, I agree hundred percent. I'll share one quick thing just to wrap up on the sports piece is uh, I remember a while back, I read an article, I think it was in Forbes or fortune, one of those, and they were talking about key ingredients to successful CEOs. And one of the common threads was high level sports, a, and B, they, they did a study of like, you know, which sports contributed most consistently to the high level success. And sh- surprisingly, wrestling was number one. Really? Now, there was a low number of uh, CEOs that were wrestlers because wrestlers wrestling is not as popular as football or basketball. Right. But football, football was second. Wrestling had the highest per capita correlation with high level business success. I just thought that was interesting. Now, it's not why I became a wrestler. I didn't re- I didn't read that article until, you know, 10 years ago, but uh, I just thought that was interesting. Yeah, I mean as a I don't know if you ever tried football. Did you ever try playing football? I no. was a very small person for football and I just thought this didn't make sense that I could get tackled by a 300 pounds person when I weigh 145. And when I went to wrestling, it felt like this is even, you know, we're toe to toe, we're plus or minus a couple of pounds may the true person, like the best person truly win in terms of skill and strength and speed. Right. While it is a team dynamic and you can get points for anyone who's listening, who's not familiar, it it is one-on-one, but as a combination of takedowns and pins and escapes, all those things add up to points that go towards your team. So you have to perform well on an individual basis and everyone's got to do their part to get enough points to actually beat the other team. So it is very interesting in terms of having to show up and getting your face slammed into the mat and do you escape when you're about to get pinned. That is the hardest thing when you're on your back and they've got you in a chokehold and you can't. Uh, it's hard. You want to just it's, give up. Right. But how uh, do you actually do that neck bend and roll out of it and, and escape? I, I think everyone should try wrestling. It, <laughs> it is. Tena- it <laughs> it is tenacious. It, but <laughs> well, I'll tell you my, 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 uh, my kids uh, kind of surprise me around the corners all the time and try to throw a move on me. So I still have to stay, I still have to stay sharp. Yep. Do like a leg. I don't even remember all the, the terminology, but just throw them or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All the, all the grabs and everything for sure. Awesome. So Where you are now, I mean, is this where you kind of envision yourself? Are you close to what you thought you wanted when you were younger? I mean, do you have way bigger goals and ambitions? I'm just curious because like we talked about on your show, I'm still trying to figure out what do I truly want? I'm seeing some success in my business and my podcast. Is this my quote unquote happy place or is there something else that I'm looking for? I'm, I'm looking for that as well. So would love to hear your thoughts on where you are in relation to your goals and where you'd like to go. Sure. No, it's a great question. I, um, I would say that if I look back to me being your age, I'm 56. So if I look back to being your age or even younger, I would say I've exceeded my goals already. Awesome. Um, looking at that, you know, from that perspective in terms of net worth, in terms of passive income, in terms of, you know, um, just, stature of like whatever businesses I built or whatever, um, you know, what I can command for a consulting fee or whatever. Um, so all that I would say is exceeded my 30 year old self. Right. But, um, but now that I'm where I'm at, you know, it it never ends. It's like, you know, you, you win a championship let's go back to sports. You know, you win, you win a championship in whatever sport. It's not like you're like, well, I don't want to win next year. You You want to win again next year. So now that I'm wherever I'm at and I'm not saying it's, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not in the, you know, uh, the stratosphere of, of many, but, but I'm certainly, um, you know, doing better than I had projected for myself. Um, yeah, I still want to do more. I want to acquire more property. I want to, I I think I'm at a stage now, I guess the, the most succinct way I can answer your question is, um, I want to, um, you know, have more passive income. Yes. So what that looks like for me, you know, I own a couple of properties that uh, that are spitting out income for sure. And what I, you know, and I've been compiling cash for a while now, kind of waiting for a buy opportunity. And I'm not sure that's going to come because the economy, at least the real estate economy is still do well. The interest rates are low and, um, and you know, the new uh, administration seems to be wanting to infuse a lot of money into the, the system for, for, um, you know, helping people through the the COVID crisis, the economic crisis, and also, you know, infrastructure and stimulus. So 
It's very possible the, the economy, there is no buying opportunity, air quotes, uh, that, that I'm putting up right now. So uh, I, th- I think my next step is um, to, to buy a couple properties cash so that those are pure cash flow. And then the cash flow from those acquisitions would pay off my existing properties that have you know some with significant loans on them. And then that that can set me up in you know not so long of the future to, to be a, a pure cash flow property owner, um, which at the age I'm at is kind of just the right timing. Yeah, I love that. And that's a great frame of reference for myself. Thank you for sharing that because I have so many more goals that I want to achieve and I'm nowhere near where I think my potential is. And of course, hopefully you never hit your potential because you're always raising the bar. I, I heard somewhere that once people retire, they tend to just die very soon because they have no more sense of purpose They don't know what what it is that they do. And so most entrepreneurs that I've met, and I'm sure you feel similarly, while you want to have passive income in properties and truly get that mailbox money, you still love the thrill of business and growing and learning and coaching. And I'm sure I would take a bet that you'd probably love to do that, even if it's for fun or for free down the road, if you're at that level where you don't no longer need the money just to be doing what you love every single day. I mean, can you see yourself ever truly retiring? I I don't think many people do. No, I, I, um, I mean, I see things changing. And what I mean by that is like, so, so I do some coaching and consulting and that's a per a dollar per hour activity. Right. So that's not really a a great use of my time in terms of making money. Right. It could be higher and higher, but still trading time. Yeah. it's, 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 yeah. You're trading time for money. So, I, but I don't do it for the money. I, I do it because it keeps me sharp. It's interesting. I'm helping people. Yeah. I'm learning from them as I'm coaching them. So for all those reasons, it's like, you know, I don't want to coach, you know, eight hours a day, five days a week. But, you know, to have a day of the, my week, which is about what I do, I have about a day of my week dedicated to coaching. It just stimulates it. And so that's something I do um, not for the money, although there's some money involved. Uh, but I, I do it because of all the reasons I just described. And so, you know, everyone has different thresholds. It's like, you know, I've been taking risks, uh, let's say starting significant risks, you know, starting at the age of 30 until, you know, ongoingly now. And, um, you know, at a certain point for me, I'm at a level, a, a level of enough comfort financially where I'm like, you know, I want to take less risks. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to blow it at this point. So that's why, you know, buy the buildings cash, have them pay off existing buildings and just kind of grow my net worth and passive income organically that way. So I can still continue to coach or maybe I'll even I have a a coaching license in soccer. Right. So you have to be licensed to coach soccer. Um, So, you know, maybe I'll with I would love to coach a, a team, you know, like a youth team and stuff like that. So I don't see myself retiring in the traditional sense where you're golfing every day. Uh, I don't even like golf, but anyway, uh, 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 I like more active things. I like tennis and different things, but um, so I would, I don't think I'd retire in that way, but I could see doing less day-to-day grind in the business, so to speak, and more like, you know, coaching, which is something you can do remotely. And then you're still getting that mailbox money and feeling, feeling like you can have a balance. Definitely. And you're working because you want to, not because you have to. Exactly. I, think I made that comment on my story is that I, I'd love to acquire properties and investment properties such as like you're, like you're doing now and have that pay down all the debt and the mortgages. And that way you truly are getting that passive freedom, the passive income. And of course, no, no income is truly a hundred percent passive. There may be issues that come up, but you could also put people and property managers in place to handle that. So you can remove yourself from that if you like. Um, but very inspiring just to hear that. I think that's a level where many people in my audience would love to to get to and working because they want to, not because they have to. None of us want to get to that age where we want to retire or at least stop working as much. And we have to work as a Walmart greeter, for example. You see it all the time. So many people don't have savings and they don't have a way of producing income or adding value to, to raise that dollar per hour. They're, they're only getting $10 an hour, whatever the minimum wage is. Um, so it's it's great to just level up your skills like you have done, invest in properties and invest in businesses, take some risk so that you can put yourself in that position where you choose to work and you don't have to. So uh, 100%, 100% for sure. 
Awesome. So I want to be respectful of your time. I know you have another appointment coming up here soon. Is there any last key takeaway you'd like to drop for the audience or something that you think the the message should end with? Well, you know, I, I think ultimately um, what I've learned and what I, again, you know, bringing up my kids, what I try to pass on to my kids is, um, you know, not only that you have to take those kind of risks to, to generate the financial situation you want, but you're always going to be more successful if you're doing something you love. That's a, a privilege and a, um, a luxury that not everybody gets, you know, to, to pursue something they love for whatever reason. Maybe they don't figure it out. Maybe they can't afford an education. Um, you know, maybe they can't make enough money at what it is they love. But if you can, if you, you can blend what you love uh, with what you do for money, uh, I think that's uh, that's a, that's one of the key things. And so, you know, do I love real estate? I mean, I you know, real estate's been really good to me. I don't know that real estate is my life's passion, but coaching people and consulting people uh, and helping people that that is that is a big part of my passion. So so I blended those where I'm like making the money that the real estate industry can can create for someone, and yet. Um, also sharing and, and helping others people grow. And that's kind of blends that fulfillment, if you will. This is really cool. I think you are me in the future. I'm speaking to my <laughs> future self because I, I'm right there with you in terms of, you know, I'm, I'm getting that real estate success where I've had some of the big months, the 20, 30 K months, more money than I had ever made in my life previously. But at the same time, I feel like, okay, this is great. The money's awesome, but am I truly making impact? Am I having a lot of fun doing this, showing houses, writing offers? Not always. So being able to impact people, having our podcast, I think that speaks to the fact that we just love connecting with people and sharing. And so I'm also very motivated just hearing your story because I can see where you are as where I am working and aspiring to be. So thank you, Rob, once again. Where can our listeners go to listen to your podcast, to learn more about you and to connect with you? I appreciate that. Uh, the name of the podcast is Clear Choices, and the website is clearchoices.live, or you can find me on Spotify and Apple and all those other sources. And And the last thing I'll say to you, Chris, is if I'm you in the future, you should start using Propecia now, because as, <laughs> as you can see, I am completely bald and you have a great head of hair. So <laughs> thank you. Thank so, you. so get I it, get ahead. It. Look, I told my hairstylist the other day, I was like, Hey, I think I'm starting to lose a little bit. What's going on over here? But I appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> well, my, my, my hairstylist is a razor blade. So, you know, <laughs> Hey, well, you have a great shaped head. So that, that goes a long way. Cause sometimes people shave it and they've got all kinds of stuff going on. So thank you once again, Rob, really appreciated connecting with you today. And I know our audience has as well. Everyone make sure to go follow Rob, listen to his podcast, check out our interview on there as well and uh, stay connected. All right. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. Thank you so much.